Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. What, why, and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 29th of January 2023. Today is the second day of pre prediction and all those people who were not able to take the examination in the offline mode can still do so in the online format until this midnight. So please log in to e-learn and attempt pre prediction Let us now begin the discussion. So the first news that we have taken has appeared in the Indian Express Explained section last week. Seven killed in synagogue attack as West Bank violence spirals. So a Palestinian gunman killed seven people and wounded three others in a synagogue on the outskirts of Jerusalem last week. In an attack that heightened fears of a spiral in bloodshed a day after the deadliest Israel raid in the West Bank in years. And this is just one of the instances every week when you get to read about Israel and Palestinian conflict. And whenever you read an article on Israel Palestinian conflict, always there are terms like Golan Heights, Gaza Strip, West Bank, and terms like Israeli settlements. And so it is very, very difficult for beginners and aspirants to understand these terms. And in order to be able to understand that, you have to go through complicated history which has to be simplified and daily news simplified is all about that. So today we will understand first what is the historical context into Israel-Palestinian conflict which will enable you to understand all the news articles which appear henceforth. And so in order to be able to understand what is happening right now, we will have to go back in history to the time when there was extreme persecution of Jews which resulted in the migration of Jews from Europe and various other parts of the world to Palestine which led to the passage of UN resolution which were followed by two important wars which were fought by Israel and Arabian countries 1948 Arab-Israel war and Israel six day war. So now the current map of Israel and Palestine which you see on Google map or on world map today is something which did not exist 100 years ago because 100 years ago there were very few Jews who lived in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Most of them had already migrated to various European cities and countries. But the problem was that wherever Jews went, they had to face extreme persecution both from Muslims as well as from Christians. And hence a movement emerged among Jews living in European countries which took up the cause of persecution and talked about escaping this persecution. It actively talked about creation of a state solely or only meant for Jews. And this particular movement came to be known as Zionist movement. So basically Jews were persecuted in European countries. They decided they will gather, unite and move to location on earth where they will establish their own state which will be just for them. And the place which was identified by them was Palestine. And so once it was decided that Palestine will be the place where they will set up their own country, they started to migrate. But the question arises, how could this migration take place? Now they could migrate because of special situation which was created as a result of World War I. If you know the context of World War I, you know that as a result of it, the Ottoman Empire which controlled the most of the region of the Middle East disintegrated as a result of World War I. And as the settlement of World War I, the administration of the Palestinian region was handed over to the British people. And you can see the Palestine in the red color marked over here and you can see that under British, French and Russian protection. And this particular arrangement where British, French and Russian governments decided to trifurcate the whole region among themselves is known as sykes picot Agreement. So two things happened simultaneously in favor of Jews. The disintegration of Ottoman Empire, an empire which claimed to be the protector of the Muslims. The existence of such an empire would have prevented the inflow of Jews to this particular region because it was controlled by a very very powerful Ottoman Empire which disintegrated in 1915 to 16 and at the same time the territory Palestine which was identified under the Zionist movement will be the place where all the Jews will migrate fell under the British occupation and Britishers since the beginning were quite sympathetic to the cause of the Jews protection and their persecution but as soon as the world war ended and a new set of governments started to form in Europe, another factor was added into the migration or giving a big boost to the migration of Jews from Europe to the Palestine, which was emergence of a lot of fascist governments across Europe. 
one of them you know is hitler another one was mussolini and so what you have across europe is wide level of persecution which extended well beyond germany and so as more and more fascists and anti jews government rose up in europe the persecution of jews reached unprecedented level not even seen during medieval times and this resulted into the kind of migration which was never seen by jews in the history so now starting with zionist movement as reason number 2 disintegration of ottoman empire and occupation of palestine by britishers and third is that now you have fascist regime which were actively persecuting jews which was unseen before and so as a combined result of all these factors the more and more number of jews started arriving in a very very small territory of palestine which was earlier mainly populated by arab muslims and so what you have till 1947 is that this palestinian territory is just receiving more and more number of jews flowing in from germany from sweden from france and from various other places in europe and they are just arriving and making up their own homes inside palestine because this particular territory is controlled by british they are allowing the people to come in but by the time 1947 and 1948 came a massive alarm was raised by local arabs because now they were concerned about the increasing population of jews and they started an armed militant movement against the in migrants or the jews and so this of course resulted in a retaliation from jewish side and this led to a lot of violence in the one particular year from 1947 to 48 but now it is 1947 48 and world war 2 has already ended and now the britishers had made up their mind to vacate the middle east including the palestinian region and so they decided to establish a proper state which the world would recognize as israel or nation state for jewish people and hence united nations security council passed a resolution in which voted to split the earlier palestinian region into three states one arab state another one jewish state and the third one would be the jerusalem city and so this un resolution was passed in 1947 and this resolution is known by the name of un resolution number no. 181 And so now is the time to understand how the map of Palestine changed after this particular resolution. So you can clearly see that there are three colors in this map. Blue denotes the Jewish regions, pinkish orange color denotes the Arab regions, and the yellow one is international city of Jerusalem. So this was the condition starting 1948. And so this was the first time when the boundaries were actually drawn in the state of Palestine. So earlier what you had was complete Palestine owned and possessed and inhabited populated by arabs but after the resolution what you have is a trifurcation of the same state into three parts you can see clearly that jews were given a lot of territory and arabs were made limited to just the orangish areas and so this was the first time when the jews got the legal right recognition from across the world to make up their own home state or home nation So as you can totally understand it's quite common sensical what would have been the reception of this UN resolution it was wholeheartedly accepted by Jews because since 100 years there was a demand among the Jews for their own home state which they finally got through UN resolution number no. 181 but as far as arabs are concerned they completely rejected the UN resolution it's not difficult to think why the response was such because the earlier territory which completely belonged to them 50% more than 50% of that was given to Jews and so they not only rejected the UN resolution but at the same time they said that any further talks would not be entertained and we are going to fight it back and take it away from the Jews and so here now what you have is genesis of one of the world's most cluttered and disputed territories when the arabs rejected the united nations resolution they also promised with each other that they are going to win back the areas which have been given to the jews which resulted in a lot of wars but we are going to keep ourselves limited to 1948 arab israel war and israel six day war because these are the two wars which have resulted into drastic changes in the map of the israel and palestine and these are the locations which are frequently asked in upsc prelims examination and through this discussion you will understand the importance of each and every territory 
So in 1948, following the declaration of the State of Israel, the group of Arab nations known as Arab League decided to intervene on behalf of their Palestinian brothers. By ordering their troops and military to marching into the areas of Palestine, especially those areas which were given to the Jews. Overall, the war was quite prolonged, but Israel emerged victorious because it not only retained its own mandate, it not only retained the territories which were allocated to it through UN resolution, but it was also able to capture around 60% of the territory which was given to the Arab people. So now after the end of this war, the Jews extended their area of control within Palestinian region. And so for next 10 to 15 years, things remained almost the same until in 1967 when Israel fought six day war with its surrounding neighbors which was actually started by Israel because Israel had this kind of premonition that the neighboring states are going to attack it. And so Israel started conducting preemptive strikes on Egypt, Syria and Jordan. And the interesting outcome of the war was not just that it defeated the combined armies of Egypt, Syria and Jordan, but Israel also managed to get control over some of the most strategically important points in Egypt, Syria and Jordan, which would then go a long way in defending Israel in future. So for example, it captured completely Sinai Peninsula and Gaza Strip. It took away Golan Heights which are located over here from Syria and then it took West Bank which can be seen marked in the blue color over here and East Jerusalem from Jordan. So before the beginning of the war, Israel was just limited to the area which I am shading in blue color. It did not have Gaza Strip, it did not have Sinai Peninsula, it did not have West Bank, it did not have Syrian region of Golan Heights which are very very important strategically to protect Israel from Syria. But after the war ended, the Israel had access to Suez Canal through Sinai Peninsula. It completely controlled West Bank, Gaza Strip and also the Golan Heights. Now of course the current map of Israel does not show Sinai Peninsula as a part of Israel. And so that is because Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt in response to Egypt becoming the first country, first Muslim country to recognize the existence of Israel as a formal state. So that was like a quid pro quo. You recognize us and we'll give back your territory to you. But it has held on, stuck to the other territories even now. It still controls Gaza Strip and West Bank. It still controls most of the Jerusalem. Now whenever you read the news about Israel and Palestine, this is the one term because of which the news appears and that is called the settlements of Israeli people in Palestine. So what are these settlements? Of, of course the Jewish people are settling in this particular region since more than 80 years now. And so what is this new stuff known as settlements? So settlements are basically civilian establishments for Jews. But they are known as settlements, there is a particular term settlement is used only for those colonies which are built on land occupied by Israel after 1967 war. So if you make a house or a home or a colony inside this particular region, there is no trouble. But we know that in 1967, Israel occupied and started controlling the West Bank as well. And so what Israel does is that it comes up with new colony here, expelling the Arabs from that particular region. And this has seen a continuous upswing in past 10 years, especially with the election of Mr. Netanyahu, who has been extremely, extremely nationalist in his outlook and approach towards the Arab people. So now this is a clear violation of UN resolution because the UN resolution limited the Jews only to the region which was allocated to them. But now these Jewish people have started to make their homes inside the Arabian territories as well. And so now what you see on the screen is a gradual transformation of Israel's ethnicity in terms of the occupation. And so the light green color in the dark background shows the continuous reduction in the area populated by Arabs and you can see a drastic decline after 1960 because then in 1970 onwards Israel's national government started to take up the colonies earlier settled by Arab people, expelled them because they have brute force on the ground and now they are making up territories, colonies and occupations inside the Palestinian lands. So these settlements have led to a lot of violence in this particular region. So that is the reason number one because of which we hear the news related to Israel and Palestine. Now the reason because of which in last 10 days Israel has appeared in the newspaper is because of the clashes taking place at Al-Aqsa Mosque which is the third holiest site in Islam. And it sits on a plateau 
which is also the holiest site for Jews, who refer to it as the Temple Mount because it was the location of biblical temples. Romans destroyed the second temple in 70 AD with only the western wall remains. And the mosque was of course built much later. And so what you have right now, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and then you have a wall which is the holiest site for Jews. And in recent years, groups of religious and nationalist Jews escorted by Israeli police have started to visit the compound or this campus in greater numbers and they have started to hold prayers in defiance of the rules which were signed in 1967. Now Palestinians view the frequent visit by Israelis as an attempt to ignite violence. The Palestinian view is that more and more Israelis will start visiting and they will eventually take over the control over their one of the holiest mosques across the world which is the Al-Aqsa Mosque which is also one of the only few places still not controlled by the Israeli people. Because this particular location containing both Al-Aqsa Mosque and the wall is under the custody of neighboring country Jordan. The site is open to tourists during certain times but only Muslims are allowed to pray there and the western wall is the holiest site where the Jews can pray. And now since the Jewish police has started to visit this particular region, the Palestinians and the Arabs are now increasingly concerned about the increasing control of the Israel on their holiest site. Halwa, briefcase and other union budget related facts. So Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman will present the union budget on 1st of February. The halwa ceremony to mark the final stage of the budget preparation was held on 26th of January. So in this regard, if you have looked at the questions in the prelims examination in the past year and also in the mains examination, the basics about the budget are very very important. The constitutional provisions especially. And so in this regard, Navid sir has already done a very detailed discussion. So we are going to listen to that discussion from the perspective of constitutional provisions dealing with the budget. Now before moving forward, there is an announcement for you. The announcement is that the budget of 2021-22 shall be discussed in detail in your classes by Baswa sir. So for the detailed analysis of this year's budget, and how this year's budget will be important for your upcoming prelims and mains examination. That aspect will be taken by Baswa sir in your classes in detail. However, in today's DNS, let us understand certain basics with respect to the budget presented by the Finance Minister of India for the year 2021-22. Now when we say budget, it simply means an account. An account for earnings as well as expenditure. Now in this earnings and expenditure account, there are two aspects of accounts. One is a revenue account and one is a capital account. Now since we are mentioning about budget, you should also know that the provisions of budget has also been provided in the constitution of India. And this has been provided under article 112 and article 113. And there are other provisions as well. Now the constitution of India does not mention the term budget. However, it mentions about a term known as annual financial statement, which I am sure you must have heard about. Now the Ministry of Finance along with the annual financial statements also presents certain key budget documents. Let us go through these key budget documents. So the list of budget documents presented to the parliament beside finance minister's budget speech includes annual financial statement as already mentioned above, demand for grants, finance bill, statements mandated under fiscal responsibility and budget management act namely the macroeconomic framework statement and the medium term fiscal policy come fiscal policy strategy statement. Now UPSC asked a question in your prelims examination in the prelims of 2020 based on this aspect. So these documents becomes very important for you to understand from your examination perspective. Other documents include expenditure budget, receipt budget, expenditure profile, budget at a glance, Memorandum explaining the provisions in the finance bill, output outcome monitoring framework, key features of budget 2021-22 and implementation of budget announcement for the year 2020-21. So these are some of the important key documents regarding budget which you must know. Now regarding the question asked by UPSC in the prelims examination, this was the question. It says that along with the budget, the finance minister also places other documents before the parliament which include the macroeconomic framework statement. This aforesaid document is presented because this is mandated by. Now here the correct answer was D. That is it is presented because it has been provided as one of the provisions in the 
Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act of 2003. So we understand that we have to know about these important documents, especially about annual financial statement, which has been provided under Article 112. So it highlights that the President of India shall in respect of every financial year. So this annual financial statement is presented in the parliament every financial year cause to be laid before both the houses of parliament. Now this becomes important. A statement of estimated receipts and expenditure of the government of India for that year in this part referred to as the annual financial statement. So if we go through the provisions of article 112, few things becomes important that the president every year shall cause to be laid before both houses of parliament that is both Lok Sabha and Rat Sabha and annual financial statement. Now regarding annual financial statement, it says that the estimates of expenditure embodied in the annual financial statement shall show separately a the sums required to meet expenditure described by this constitution as expenditure charged upon the consolidated fund of India. So this aspect of the expenditure, namely the expenditure charged upon the consolidated fund of India shall be shown separately. And this expense charged upon the Consolidated Fund of India shall not be voted upon. However, discussions can take place in the parliament with respect to the expenditure charged upon CFI. The second aspect of the expenditure which has to be shown separately is sums required to meet other expenditure proposed to be made from the Consolidated Fund of India. So it mentions about two kinds of expenditure. One, expenditure charged upon the Consolidated Fund of India and second, other expenditure proposed to be made from the Consolidated Fund of India. And it further says, and shall distinguish expenditure on revenue account from other expenditure. So this is what has been stated in Article 112 with respect to annual financial statement. Now, since we have gone through Article 112, let us also go through Article 113 as it pertains to demand for grants. So it highlights that so much of the estimates as relates to expenditure charged upon the CFI shall not be submitted to the vote of parliament. The point which we just highlighted here that the expense charged upon the consolidated fund of India shall not be voted upon. However, it says that nothing in this clause shall prevent or shall be construed as preventing the discussion in either house of parliament as any of those estimates. So it basically means that regarding the expenditure charged upon the Consolidated Fund of India, discussions can take place. However, voting is not permitted. Now it further mentions about estimates as relates to the other expenditure. Now regarding this other expenditure which pertains to demand for grants, it says that it shall be submitted in the form of demand for grants to the house of the people that is Lok Sabha. Now this aspect becomes important here. It further highlights and the house of the people shall have power to assent or to refuse to assent to any demand or to assent to any demand subject to a reduction of the amount specified therein. So basically the Lok Sabha has the power either to accept the demand or not to accept the demand. However, this aspect of demand for grant has to be voted upon. Now voting for demand for grant also shows strength of the government on the floor of the house. Now, based on this understanding, let us take up this particular question asked by UPS in the prelims of 2011. The question was when the annual union budget is not passed by the Lok Sabha. Options were A. The budget is modified and presented again. B. The budget is referred to the Rat Sabha for suggestions. C. The union finance minister is asked to resign. And D. The prime minister submits the resignation of the council of ministers. Now, here the correct answer was D. Because not passing the union budget by the government shows that the government does not have sufficient majority on the floor of the house or in the Lok Sabha. And hence the Prime Minister has to submit his resignation of his Council of Ministers. So again these conceptual clarities are important for you to answer such type of tricky questions asked by UPSC. Now let us also go through some of the questions asked by UPSC pertaining to budget in the mains examination. Now in the year 2019, the question asked was the public expenditure management is a challenge to the government of India in the context of budget making during the post liberalization period. Clarify. Next question asked by UPSC in 2018 was 
comment on the important changes introduced in respect of the long term capital gains and dividend distribution tax in the union budget for 2018-19 a question framed in 2017 read as one of the intended objectives of the union budget 2017-18 is to transform energize and clean india now analyze the measures proposed in the budget of 2017-18 to achieve the above said objective again a question on gender budgeting was asked in 2016 the question read women empowerment in india needs gender budgeting what are the requirements and status of gender budgeting in the indian context this was taken up in 2016 now two questions were asked in 2013 related to frbm and budget the question related to frbm read what are the reasons for introduction of fiscal responsibility and budget management act of 2003 discuss critically its salient features and their effectiveness so a direct question on frbm was also asked by upsc in the mains examination and this question read what is the meaning of the term tax expenditure taking housing sector as an example discuss how it influences budgetary policies of the government so we see a variety of questions asked by upsc on diverse topics based on the theme of indian budget so the themes which we are going to discuss becomes important with respect to your upcoming prelims and mains examination now regarding budget we had discussed that it is an accumulation of the government's earnings or receipts as well as the expenditure now let's take up this news from the explained section of indian express now this news has also appeared in the hindu newspaper in the faq section and this news talks about t plus 1 settlement cycle now from your examination perspective particularly prelims we need to know about these terms which constantly appear in the newspapers so here we'll try to understand about the t plus 1 cycle with respect to stock market so this news says that how will the t plus 1 settlement cycle impact markets what was the infrastructure required for the transition will it help investors This news in the explained section of Indian Express says that new T plus one settlement cycle comes into effect today, and it has came into effect after notification of SEBI, that is Securities and Exchange Board of India. So it says that what does this mean, and how will investors be impacted? It further highlights that India will become the second country after China to implement the one day cycle that will bring operational efficiency. faster fund remittances share delivery and ease of stock market participation so in order to understand these benefits of t plus 1 cycle we need to understand this very concept of t plus 1 settlement cycle which takes place in the stock market operations so basically this news highlights that stock market in india according to the circular of sebi have now transited or shifted from earlier t plus 2 settlement cycle to new t plus 1 settlement cycle so earlier the settlement cycle was t plus 2 and now according to the circular the cycle has now shifted to t plus 1 so let's understand this through an example suppose if a customer has purchased a share on monday so under the t plus 1 cycle the shares are credited to customer's account on tuesday so as you can see in a t plus 1 cycle the transaction generally take within 24 hours whereas had this been the t plus 2 cycle then the whole transaction would have taken place in 48 hours that is the customers purchase shares on monday then these would be credited to the customers account on wednesday so transaction of shares taking place within 24 hours is t plus 1 cycle whereas transaction of shares taking place within 48 hours that is 2 days is t plus 2 cycle so it says that a t plus 1 settlement cycle means that a trade related settlements must be done within a day or 24 hours of the completion of transaction now another important thing to know is that a trade of stock market involves three important functions or three important steps these are execution of the trade second is clearing of the trade and third is settlement so execution of trade is transaction where the seller agrees to sell and the buyer agrees to buy any security now coming to clearing and settlement 
clearing is the process of updating the accounts of trading parties and arranging for the transfer of money and securities and all process leading to settlement is called clearing and risk assessment of both parties that is the seller and the buyer is carried out at the stage of clearing now comes the third stage that is the settlement stage where the actual exchange of money or securities takes place and the money is transferred to the seller so money is transferred to the seller and security is transferred to the buyer so it says that on the settlement date funds and securities are transferred to their new owners so under the t plus 2 cycle earlier clearing and settlement used to happen on the next day and execution of the trade used to take place on the first day so there were two days involved earlier so the trade was cleared within 48 hours but under the t plus 1 settlement system trade has to be completed within 24 hours of completion of transaction which involves execution of the trade clearing and also settlement now coming to the benefits of t plus 1 settlement cycle the benefit includes obviously quicker transaction or transaction within 24 hours shorter trade settlement cycle and quick transaction or shortening of trade settlement cycle further increases market liquidity as money can be transferred within the same day or within 24 hours of transaction it will also help to boost operational efficiency as more transaction will takes place within the span of 24 hours further it will shorten settlement cycle and it will also help to reduce number of outstanding unsettled trades at any point of time because of the mandation of completion of trade within 24 hours so any transaction cannot go beyond 24 hours hence the time frame for settlement or the window for settlement decreases and because of this it also reduces settlement risk and also addresses the issue of brokers default however certain concerns have also been highlighted by some investors including foreign investors so it says that foreign portfolio investors may face problem due to difference in time zones now since the transaction needs to be completed within 24 hours so suppose if the seller is in american time zone and the buyer is in indian time zone hence the settlement period may differ for these two people so this was one of the concerns expressed by the foreign investors another concern is that global banks and fpis will find it difficult to fulfill the funding obligation because of this mandatory requirement to complete the transaction within 24 hours further because of this mandation of time limitation information flow processes and foreign exchange problems might also occur and foreign investors may also find it difficult to hedge their net india exposure in dollar terms at the end of the day under t plus 1 system so because of greater transactions taking place within 24 hours hence there is more exposure towards dollar and this may expose indian securities with respect to dollar so these are some of the concerns which has been expressed by investors with respect to shifting to t plus 1 settlement cycle now this topic becomes important both from your prelims and mains perspective under the section of indian economy and in the mains gets covered under gs paper 3 So this last news that we have taken has appeared in the Hindu newspaper. Sea winds erode Sundarbans temple. So an ancient terracotta temple in West Bengal Sundarbans which has survived the ravages of time for over a millennium is now facing a very modern threat. And this impact and this threat is directly coming from climate change especially the increase in the salinity which is gradually eroding the outer wall of jatar deol an 11th century shiva temple which is located at roydigi in south 24 parganas only a few kilometers from the sea now in this particular article there are two aspects one is from the perspective of art and culture this jatar deol temple is one of the oldest temple in the eastern india 11th century shiva temple another one is with respect to the map location and geography because if you look at the previous year question in 2020 upsc had asked among the following tiger reserves which one has the largest area under the critical tiger habitat and you can see sundarban was one of the options
Similarly, in 2019, UPSC had asked which one of the following national park lies completely in the temperate alpine zone. All the options formulated were national parks. So, you can see that Sundarban being a Ramsar site, being a tiger reserve and also being a national park is one of the most important map locations that you can prepare. So, it is important for us to look at some of the highlights of the Sundarban, which is a national park which is located in southeastern tip of 24th Parganas, which is the name of the district in West Bengal. It got its name from one of the mangrove plants known as Sundari trees. So the name Sundarban has been derived not out of the beauty but out of the trees which are named as, which are named as Sundari trees. Sundarbans are a part of world's largest delta formed by river Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna. Sundarban forms the largest tiger reserve and national park in India. The total area of Indian part of Sundarban forest is about 4,262 square kilometers, of which 2,125 square kilometers is occupied by mangrove forest across 56 islands and the balance is underwater. The park is surrounded by a buffer zone of 885 square kilometers and this also mainly consists of mangrove forest. The core area of the park has its own natural boundaries with the river Malta on its west, river Haribanga on its east, Neti Dofani and Gosba in the north. The main attraction of Sundarban are the tiger of which the delta harbour large reptiles like monitor lizard, estuarine crocodile and olive ridley turtle. The leopard, Indian rhinoceros, Javan rhinoceros, swamp deer, hog deer and water buffalo have all become locally extinct from the delta in the recent decades. Other significant facts about Sundarban is that it is one of the UNESCO Man and Biosphere Program site. It is also UNESCO's World Heritage Site inscribed in it is also UNESCO World Heritage Site inscribed in 1987 and it has been designated as Ramsar site since 2019. The Indian part of Sundarban, which constitutes 60% of the country's total mangrove forest area and includes 90% of the Indian mangrove species. The mangrove forests protect the hinterland from storms, cyclones, tidal surges and the seepage and intrusion of saltwater inland into waterways. They serve as nurseries to shellfish and finfish and sustain the fisheries of the entire eastern coast. The Sundarban Tiger Reserve has been declared as a critical tiger habitat under national law and also a tiger conservation landscape of global importance. The Sundarbans are the only mangrove habitat which supports a significant population of tigers and they have unique aquatic hunting skills. The site is also home to a large number of rare and globally threatened species such as critically endangered northern river terrapin the endangered Iravadi dolphin and vulnerable fishing cat.